Welcome to the Crazy Wisdom Podcast. My guest is Alex Molorodov, and he, is, he has in the past led a team for developing nuclear submarine systems. He ran a venture fund out of Switzerland and did some work with Apple. Uh, and now he is most interested in aligning his life's purpose uh, with really fundamental values of, of how to... Actually, I'll, I'll let you kind of... Um, let's go right into that. What are your values? How are you bringing alignment into your work? How are you kind of aligning life with work? Mm. Thank you, brother. Uh, it's good to be here. And I don't know, it's a journey and figuring out what are your values um, and bring in, you know, bring in conscious uh, intent to everything that you're doing. I think one of the things I realized and maybe many people realize is, you know, all the things that we think are our values they may not actually be our own and we may have picked them up uh, just by virtue of growing up the way we did uh, through our parents, through our teachers, through, you know, whatever things. And so part of the process is really separating those and figuring out um, which values are yours to begin with. And if, you know, um, not to say that the ones your parents gave you are bad, but the difference is whether you took them on uh, involuntarily or it's a choice. And so, yeah. And which, which you said before we started, which is how do we bring life, how do we bring ceremony into life or create a ceremonial life? And that is this sense of like, I have this conditioning that I've been given. There's hereditary conditioning. There is familial conditioning of what happened when I was a kid. There's some would say transpersonal conditioning of pre previous lives and other things. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so knowing that all of that conditioning exists and is having an impact on what is happening right now, there is also this choice or maybe intention or ceremony. What is your view on that about ceremony and about intention and consciousness and that type of issue? It's a multi-layered question. <laughs> <laughs> um, maybe we could lead into that, you know, talk a little bit about the ceremonial context in general. So, you know, at, at least for me, and I don't know, maybe a few years ago or a year ago, um, somebody would have said ceremony and immediately the image comes to mind of like a shaman in the Amazon um, and you're, you know, vomiting into a bucket after drinking ayahuasca. And, you know, that I think there is, a range of what people consider ceremonial. Um, and for me, that was kind of the, the introduction to that world. And um, I don't know if you have like specific, uh, I, mean, I think you also have experiences with that side of things, right? Uh, well, so I, I'll go into it, but I did not do ayahuasca in a, in a way that was very ceremonial. Um, I, uh, and I, it wasn't in a party atmosphere. I guess there was a, an element of ceremony, but I'll, I'll give the whole backdrop. Um, <laughs> what kind of parties are you going to, man, where people <laughs> say, you want to go in the back room and then do Aya? Yeah, no, it definitely, <laughs> definitely was not a, not a party, party atmosphere. Uh, but, uh, um, so my friend Felix, uh, who I'm going to interview eventually, uh, he, I, I met him in Thailand. We were both studying abroad in Thailand a long time ago, and we ended up traveling all over the world together and living in a bunch of different countries, learning a different bunch of different languages. He has a pretty uh, contrarian take on on psychedelics, and and there is um, uh, in the Amazon they take two different plants. Uh, you probably know more than this about this than me, uh, but there's one plant that basically in inactivates the MAOI inhibitor uh, mm -hmm. and then makes the DMT acceptable by the body so that it, that it takes it. Correct. And and that the 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 DMT is in a vine, correct? DMT is a uh, component, mm -hmm. um, and so like you said, you know, one part brings the DMT and the other brings the the blocker that allows it to pass through the blood brain barrier. And so that blocker we took as a form of a nut. And then the other one was actually not from the Amazon, but from a Taiwanese acacia tree. Um, and so it also exists in Taiwan that the, 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 uh, the DMT also exists in this tree. Uh, and, and so he just bought it off of, off, uh, when he was in Australia, he bought it off of Taiwan and then brought it to Thailand. And then we were in the jungle and we both decided to do it. Um, and, uh, and so there was a ceremonial aspect uh, because we did fast beforehand. We did 
and we we did a lot of uh, yoga postures uh, leading up to the experience. So there was a sense of intentionality, but there wasn't a shaman, unless you would consider him a shaman. Some people do, some people don't. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> uh, but so it wasn't it wasn't in this kind of structured environment. And and um, but yeah, I'd love to hear your, your take on that on that kind of. Yep. Sub- yeah, and I, I think, um, you know, there's a lot of these different plant medicines around the world and that are part of indigenous traditions. And for me, what are, one of the things that originally got me interested in, um, in ayahuasca was, and it's almost like that, you know, that social proof, if you will, where I, it, if it's existed for thousands of years and it's been used with that intention, that to me, that kind of ancient tradition is more proof than any scientific study could provide. Um, and so for me, that was immediately an interest. And I also recognized that, um, I remember it was like an article that I read and one of the things that caught my eye is, you know, this person was, uh, they spent a lot of time analyzing their patterns and understanding them, et cetera. And then they went to, to do ayahuasca and it was like 10 to 20 years of therapy in one night. And for me, that really kind of st- stuck out I was like, okay, I can spend the next 10 years trying to change my behavioral patterns. Um, maybe I can understand them pretty well, but knowledge of them doesn't change them. And it's like, okay, or I can go do it in, in one night. Mm. And so it's like, can, can be a bit of like, you know, a spiritual shortcut. And that's, and, and, you know, as with every shortcut, there is a danger to it. Uh, do you know, have you ever seen anyone have have a dan- not a dangerous uh, adverse reaction to it? I can actually kind of get to it a little bit with myself in taking that 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 experience for me is the beginning of an experience that was it was the beginning of my of of what would many people would call a shamanic initiation uh, where the things in my life after that point started to come up in a way that was very difficult to, to handle um, and kind of threw me into a spiral essentially of, of like, it, the, the, there, was a, there was a particularly bad choice that I had started making before that, um, bad choice uh, with quote marks, because uh, you know, it led me to where I am, which where I'm grateful. So, um, but it was, a, it, was a, it was a decision I had made that I had started beforehand, but then there's something about that experience that I had that also kind of continued that that choice into the future um and 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 was a really difficult thing um and so i i I, what i'm trying to get at is that i think with people with mental illnesses these 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 things can we can have a conversation about mental illness as well about these things tend to also be have side effects that are can be uh uh, damaging to people would you agree Mm. So I hear you. Mm. Um, I think I might have, uh, and by the way, just as a disclaimer, I'm not providing medical advice of any sort and you know, people shouldn't take that. Um, the way that our society defines mental conditions is to me uh, fraught with error. Mm. So we define personality disorders and mental conditions and you know, we're prescribed antidepressant, et cetera, to me, that's that's fixing a temporary symptom that's not addressing the root cause. So I fundamentally don't really believe in them um, because it's not a permanent solution. And rather than taking things for the rest of my life, I'd rather figuring out what's the trauma that's driving it and address the trauma. And so you're right, there can be complications with uh, psych- strong psychedelics, which ayahuasca very much is. Um, you know, those complications arise when people don't disclose the use of existing anti-psychotic uh, medications. Mm. So if they're on SSRIs uh, or, you know, they're on um, certain medications that they don't disclose or they have like a heart condition, then yes, there can be complications. From my experience, I haven't, I haven't seen that because usually the places I've, uh, I've been to provide a very stringent process of making sure that that doesn't happen in a very safe container. And so se- safety and setting is super important from my experience, um, not just with Aya, but with psychedelics in general, um, you know, where I think psychedelics are interesting, you know, it's like we learn by viewing and kind of by doing. And mm-hmm. so 
if you think of it in a normal plane of reality, like the 3D or matrix or just day to day, however you want to call it, you know, we see somebody say we want to learn how to like uh, cut down a tree. We're probably going to go either watch a YouTube video or gonna, we're going to ask our, our dad like, hey, can you can you do it? And you're going to learn by doing. So to me, psychedelics are the spiritual equivalent of that, where they show your soul how to be a certain way, um, how to act without ego, how to exist without uh, needing to prove yourself to people. And so then outside of the experience, your soul can reverse engineer that process. Mm. And so that's why I view it as a very potent window into the, I don't say end state, but a state that pierces through your subconscious patterns that your, your soul can then re reintegrate out inside the experience. Does that make sense? Yes, absolutely. And it kind of goes to your point about we have these things uh, that Western medical understanding uses as stop gaps. Sometimes they use it as stop gaps. So, so the, the, I was pre prescribed antidepressants for quite a long time. And, uh, the, the, the main issue I had with that was that essentially it was the doctors I had talked with basically gave it to me. And then there was no plan for how to get off. I do understand a, a short term. I'm in a really difficult space. I need something to help me numb this just a little bit for three to six weeks or some defined period where you're working with somebody who knows how to do this. And then there's an end point as well. The problem that we're facing today is that there is no end point. It's just like, here you go. You know, this like is just, this is yeah. just what you do. And then yeah. it's, it's, it's management. It's not solution. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's the same with chronic diseases. There has been studies that show that chronic diseases can actually be reversed and that our medicine, mm -hmm. actually our medical system is really good at acute medicine yeah, exactly. where, Hey, I have a gunshot. There's a bullet in me. Please take it out. Okay. But for things like chronic diseases and autoimmune diseases, there is, we don't know. And the argument um, that I've seen circulate and that I probably tend to agree with is that it, um, a lot of the physical diseases are manifestations of mental and emotional and spiritual blocks that we just haven't addressed. And so part of, you know, in, in my mind of a holistic approach to medicine and to um, just to your life is to really take care of, a multi, you know, take a multidimensional approach to taking care of yourself and release emotions and then be able to process them. And there's no such thing as necessarily as a bad emotion as to be able to feel that. And, you know, I, I think especially in our society, in a Western society where um, especially men are told to um, repress their emotions or, you know, be, be more like a man and don't cry and just like man up and, and just persevere. So that might have its applications, mm -hmm. but I think in the long term it's super damaging um, because any repression of things that are coming up is just going to come out later in other ways. And it's, yeah, it's, it's almost like that. I, I can see the use for sometimes hiding your emotions if you're in a high stake conversations, but it's the sense that it's like this, this default that you, and this is a lot of cultural programming is kind of, we, we download these, these cultural ideas of how we should behave in certain di different situations. And then we end up using that as a default for, our, for, instead of paying into what are the circumstances that are required of this immediate moment. And these circumstances are completely unique. They will, the circumstances we're under which right now are, will never be repeated again in the history of the universe. And like, it's all uh, novel. And yes, these cultural programming can be useful in a lot of ways in order to um, kind of give us a baseline, you know, as young kids, it's like young kid doesn't have the, the frontal cortex development to understand all of the conditions, but as we mature, it seems like it's necessary to uh, learn how to adapt, um, which kind of brings us back to this, 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 these, what you said about psychedelics and what medicines is, is that they allow us the soul to experience, experientially understand what it is in our life, what the um, root of the, 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 the problems are mm. yeah they they just like you mentioned you know when we're born uh, we don't have that prefrontal cortex developed and i think it develops at the age of seven and mm. so before the age of seven you know to put it into perspective what does that mean 
It means anything that you hear told to you about you, you absorb with no discernment mm -hmm. or filter. So if somebody tells you you're a bad human being, you have nothing in your brain developed that allows you to say that doesn't apply to me. Mm -hmm. And you just take that on as absolute truth, which as you can, you know, as you can imagine, might create lasting repercussions. And so we all develop these coping strategies and people in the, you know, the most loving of households and, you know, everybody's doing the best they can, including our parents and their behavior is a condition of how they grew up and whatever patterns they haven't addressed. And, you know, we take on these things as coping strategies and coping mechanisms, usually unconsciously, until we get to a point in life where usually you experience enough pain, whether it's through the death of a loved one or end of a relationship or loss of a job or some situation that brings you to a painful enough point where you start questioning your beliefs. Usually that's the inception point for your spiritual journey. And you're like, oh, I have all these things that I, you know, that served me great until now and they're perfect and you get to learn to love them because they got you to where you are. However, they're no longer serving and I have a choice to do, do things differently. And it's bringing that conscious intentionality and understanding of why you're doing certain things. Yeah. So it's not to say that, you know, I'm going to, you know, not mention my emotions at the moment, but my, my intention is to have that be a choice rather than a default reaction. Which is great, which gets into like Viktor Frankl's um, Man's Search for Meaning book where he talks about, you know, he, he, he was in a concentration camp and under mm -hmm. the most intense stress that any human being probably has ever, you know, like those, those situations represent some of the most stressful. And he found this place where he could separate stimulus from response uh, and there was a choice in there. There's always a choice in there, which kind of gets into the nature of free will and which I end up talking a lot on the show about like <laughs> about free will and like, and like that, that's the only kind of place where I can see free will happening. And it's in that moment where you're off, offered this reaction uh, and then you can make a choice as to whether you go down that path of automatic reaction or you open up to limitless spaciousness of choice. Mm, and that's that's the inherent difference between reaction mm. and response. Mm -hmm. Are you and the way and so visualization can be a powerful tool in this. And um, you know the way I sometimes visualize it for myself is like my you know entity, my mm. you know body, mind, soul are like in this castle. Yeah, you know how castles have moats, mm. and so anything that happens outside the moat is what happens externally. And when things occur. Um, it's almost like my ego sometimes wants to like run across and attack the challenge or run across and do something. And the bigger that moat is, the longer it's going to take for my ego to swim across. And that's that buffer that I build in mm. before I get to respond. Mm. And so I almost visualize there is this space between whatever the stimulus is and me needing to provide a response. And sometimes that response might be silence. Interesting. Um, this is really interesting because it reminds me of visual, visualization and my first experiences. I've always lived most of my life in my head, so not really experiencing my body for a long time. all, by the way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and, and so, and and that, and then a couple of years ago, I started to do a lot of memory training, so uh, space to memory. Uh, spaced repetition memorization um, and then I was introduced to a technique of another type of memor memorization which is what they used to use uh, uh, thousands of years ago uh, where you build a mind memory palace where you actually use your faculty of visualization to go back to a memory and place things that you want to remember in that memory um, and I noticed when I was introduced to this that I had never developed this faculty of visualization of actually and then this gets into psychedelics and plant medicines as well, because they mm. um, uh, kind of almost uh, inject a visual visual uh, imagination type of experience into your your uh, into your life, uh, which gets into the nature of human beings as visual things. In in mice, their main sense is smell, olfactory, and they their emotions are experienced through the sense of, of smell and we as human beings our brain is devoted towards vision mostly um, and and so we experience 
and for me, I was blocked off from this. And I think I made a conscious decision when I was younger. Now, I was depending on what you mean by conscious, but I I blocked off this this sense of visualization, creative visualization, um, which then came back in a uh, interesting way once I started to use these techniques and stuff. Mm. And how did that inf- you know how did that influence your your perception and interaction with the world? Uh, it changed it quite a bit because I was. I realized that there was the, that I blocked it off. And so then I, I, I've, and I'm still haven't actually, I haven't done a lot of work on that particular memory that I, that I, that I, that I remember of blocking it off. Um, uh, but it allowed me to have tap much more um, clearly into my creative faculties um so being able to to uh create more to be more spontaneous uh and to kind of let my imagination run wild um uh in a way that I, that a memory that i had had blocked that off um for various reasons mm-hmm. yeah and and creativity is an interesting uh topic as it relates to especially flow and you know um i think we briefly touched upon this uh in one of our earlier conversations that with the advent of artificial intelligence, how exactly are people remaining relevant? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And the way that I've thought about it that's helpful for me is, you know, if you think of that intersection of, a, of compassion um, and creativity, and, you know, there is a quadrant there where it's high compassion and uh, like high creativity that is the domain of flow. That's the domain of human capability that machines cannot touch and, in my opinion, would not be able to emulate. Mm. Um, and so who are the people that can already be there? And if you look at musicians, you look at uh, high performance athletes, you look at, you know, there, there are people in different fields that regularly tap into that state of flow, whether consciously or not, uh, in order to perform better than what most people would consider normal. Yeah. And so we call them artists, uh, let's say, as a, as a general term. However, I would, I would argue that that term actually applies to every human being. Mm-hmm. And all of us can choose to learn to tap into that state of flow with sufficient deprogramming of, 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 of prior patterns. And so, you know, the question for humanity becomes, how do we enable all of society to enter a state of flow and be, if you will, artists? Mm. And whatever it is that they're doing, whether it's an artist in business, an artist in baking, the question is, are you doing it through state of flow and coming from love? In which case, it doesn't matter what AI does, in my opinion, and you'll be perfectly fine to maintain your livelihood. That is a really good point because it gets into so many people are coming from a place of fear right now about what technology is going to do to us. Um, and there is some validity to that fear. I would say that, that, that a lot of things are going to change. And of course, most of us fear things that, that fear change. Um, but then there is so much opportunity as well. And, and this is, this is what I love about this point that you make is that that opportunity requires our spiritual work and not work in the sense of mechanical work, because that's the exact type of work that's going to be taken over by machines. It's, it's this, how would you describe that work of spiritual work and the difference between spiritual work and mechanical work and looking at, we've already been discussing it a lot, but like um, what, what, what do people mean? What do you mean when you say spiritual work? If you you would use that term. You know, we could call it spiritual work. We could call it something else. I think at some point, um, you know, I view as like consciousness and spirituality as the degree to which you recognize that the world doesn't revolve around you. And then there is a higher level of intelligence at work and that intelligence isn't you. Mm-hmm. And so part of that, um, so to me, it's just inner work. Yeah. And at some point, it, I think it has to evolve to this understanding or concept of a higher power um, or the universe or spirit or God, however you choose to define it. And the, you know, it's a lot easier for people to blame the world. And, you know, we all have people in our lives that say, Oh, you know, this happened to me and this happened to me. And, you know, I was fired here and I was hired, you know, all this stuff happening to you. And so you feel like you're controlling things. And as a result, it's your own failure. 
Um, so with an internal, through internal work, you can actually shift your per perception. And so externally, the events might be identical. However, your reaction to them, which is the only thing that you can control, which is what Viktor Frankl talks about in his book, actually, and your reaction is what you get to learn to control. And you can view all those changes as, okay, you're actually not in control and that it's an illusion and that whatever experiences we're having were divinely orchestrated mm. to happen at this point in time. And the only point of our experience is to grow. And so if we choose to approach it from that perspective, the only question you get to ask yourself is, okay, what can I, what can I choose to learn from this experience? Mm. Yeah. And so the more you do that, that, that adds up and eventually, you know, no matter what is happening, um, you get to look at it and you're like, hmm, interesting. Okay. And what can I learn? And then you trust that you're being given this experience as an opportunity to grow. So I'd love to, to shift the conversation and include that in the conversation with, with, with business. The main question that I've had in my own life is, um, can I, can I do business from a place of clear spiritual understanding uh, with spiritual or with life values and life principles? Um, and does that actually make business better? Can you do better business by doing those things? What do you think? So the, the short answer is fuck yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think I think it was Harvard uh, Business Review published a study that like conscious companies do six or ten times better than than others. Um, and having like run a venture fund where my focus was on looking for conscious founders, um, it you know the the question comes down to this, the the conscious intent, yeah. And what is the intent behind what a person is doing? And so in in business, you can traditionally you're driven by profits, you're driven by you know, market share, you're driven by achieving a certain number of revenues. So yes, and there's also another, let's say, parallel track to that, that is the impact that you have on the world and wanting to give and share. So it's a concept of lack versus abundance. And if you are being driven out of lack, like I don't have enough money, I'm going to go and sell a company and make a shit ton of it. Okay, mm -hmm. that's that's one side, as opposed to the concept of abundance, where I have these certain unique gifts that I would like to share with the world and I'm going to operate from that. And, and the two are not necessarily mutually exclusive in my experience. And so actually I, I, there are examples of founders um, and companies where I look for which one is the primary motivator mm -hmm. rather whether it's one or the other. Mm -hmm. So I look for, and I have seen people be more successful where they're motivated by an abundance mindset of wanting to give and gift um, and not wanting to necessarily receive and so but also running a responsible business where you know it doesn't you know just because you're focused on consciousness doesn't mean you get to just like not pay attention to your revenues and costs and figure out how to actually scale it those are the supporting blocks rather than the primary motivator does that make mm -hmm. sense yeah absolutely and it and it I want to go back to the abundance and scarcity thing because it's a question that I've been, I want uh, in a previous podcast guest, I was talking about scarcity and abundance. And then this brings a nuance into it because there are scarce situations. We can find ourselves in situations which are scarce. Uh, for example, you know, in times of war, in times of depression, in times of financial scarcity. So the scarcity does exist, but then even within that scarce situation the thing that will at least make you the most comfortable with that scarce situation is the abundance mindset because from what i understand now in this conversation i'm getting is that in those scarce situations the the type of thing that victor frankl talks about is a, an abundance of spirit because a spirit is always abundant what do you think yeah so i <laughs> The happiest people that I've seen are in some of the poorest areas in the world. Yeah. So people living in the middle of the jungle on the Amazon in Peru who have absolutely nothing by our Western definitions, they were, they were so much happier than half the investment bankers. Like go to New York and look around. People are looking at their phone. People look miserable, unhappy, sleep deprived, overworked. I'm like, yeah, you're making whatever, two, 300 grand a year. And this is your condition. Like, 
that's that's a stark comparison. And so happiness is not something that you get externally. It's something it's your frame of mind and it's your it's your choice to accept uh, where you're at and have full trust that you are exactly where you're at to learn the list the lessons that you need to learn. Mm-hmm. And so you know, from that perspective, you can approach life that way. And so if, you know, let's say it's a quote unquote unscare, scarce situation, which I would still, you know, question because that requires a subjective judgment for somebody to believe something is scarce. Um, I would mm-hmm. say you're in, in a, a situation and I, I would choose to operate from a place of I am where I need to be in order to learn the lessons and I am supported and I am divinely guided and that there is, there is nothing that can happen because why, why are the reasons that we do these things a lot of times? And it's to feel loved and to feel like we belong. Mm-hmm. And once you reach a place where I already have that innately within me, it completely irrespective of what's happening around me, I recognize that I am loved because I am not because of what I do. Yep. And after that, I'm like, I don't feel the need to do anything to prove anything to anyone. Mm. And that's beautiful because that gets into something that I learned from somebody named Christopher Wallace, who's a Sanskrit scholar who's gone back and translated a lot of the ninth century Kashmiri texts. And he talks about the, if your spiritual practice is motivated by lack, which most of us get into it from this understanding of uh, there's something wrong with me, there's something painful with me, and I've got to fix that. If it's motivated by that, it will never be effective. So at some point, once we've realized that that's happening, we have to make the switch to a practice motivated by not by what's wrong with us, but by what is uncovering what that is, that is great and that is perfect. In a sense, there are conditioned aspects around that that are imperfect and that are fallible and, 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 and you know, can be um, uh, fixed for lack of a better word. Um, but at our core, we are, we are divine. We are uh, uh, unstruck. The word unstruck is the one that keeps on coming back to me because the yogis talk about nada, which is the unstruck sound, the substrate of reality uh, the, that, that is perfect and, and binary almost. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, that, that, that resonates. Mm-hmm. Um, what I what what I'd add to that is you you know partially talking about shadow work, which is some of the deepest levels of self work that you can do, um, mm-hmm. and you know what what that talks about is we all have like a shadow part of us uh, that we haven't fully integrated, and so you know arguably every time we're triggered by you know when I'm like I walk really fast, and mm-hmm. when I when I find people on the on the sidewalk who are like walking too slow in New York like damn it why don't you just move faster yeah. and um or you know people are being loud on the train um or etc and so I, I i would up until now would always get triggered by that and what i realized through shadow work is i was like okay so every time that happens there's actually more of a reflection of something in me that a shadow part of me either that um, i don't like about myself now or i didn't like about myself in the past that I chose was like that I said was sick and that I had to fix. And so it hasn't received love. And so for me, I recognize that there was, you know, a part of me that maybe wishes I could be that loud person on the train and not care so much what other people think. And I recognize that there's that inner child in me that would want to do that. And I, instead I turn inward and and send them love. Mm -hmm. And so to your point of, you know, we, we do have these, you know, shadow parts or darker parts and they're perfect in their design because they got you to where you are today to have the realization that they exist today. Mm. And you get to be grateful for that rather than just repressing that part and saying, oh, this was bad. Now I'm going to be good. No, everything in you is good. It's just your matter of perspective. Mm. And until that happens, that integration can't happen. And this brings up the question of the, what relationship psychedelics have to shadow work. And, and, and I, I, psilocybin for me has been one of the most important ones, I think, in this, in this, in this regard, in terms of it, it almost brings on the depression sometimes, but not in the way, but it brings it on to be cleared, essentially. Um, what do you think about the relationship between shadow work and, and uh, psychedelics or plant medicine? 
an interesting question. I think, um, I think in general, they're very, they're tightly linked. Yeah. And you've done ayahuasca and like, I've also said in a number of ceremonies, not just with Aya, but uh, with other uh, plants and they <laughs> said that they show you exactly where you're ready to experience. And it's, you know, almost like the ultimate personalized medicine because it's going to show you what your mm -hmm. subconscious is ready to, to deal with. It's not going to give you things that you aren't ready for. And so it brings back, you know, bring us, brings us back to that concept of what we're talking about ceremonial. And so the, the major lesson that I've extracted for myself and that I endeavor to apply every day is that life is a ceremony. It's not you sitting in a, you know, in a circle with a shaman and, and drinking plant medicine. Um, but what, what, what is a ceremony? It's about going into something with conscious intent. It's being open to receiving information and it's having the commitment to yourself and to the world to integrate the learnings that you get day to day and to do the work. And so for me, I can approach walking down the street and just looking at trees the same way that I can approach with the same intent as I would going into an IS ceremony or having a coffee with a friend. And all it takes is I am consciously setting the intention to be open to learn from whatever this, whatever is happening. I'm going to challenge my ego when and if it comes out. And if I learn some new insights, yeah, I'm going to talk to other people about it. I'm going to do that reflection, feel into it. And if it resonates, I'm going to integrate it, which suddenly it makes your growth go exponential because now you're not doing your, you know, once in a lifetime IS ceremony, you're in constant ceremony every second of your life. That's really important because that essentially gets to the point that you don't need any of these plant medicines. And I think that a lot of times the, 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 that's what they kind of lead you to anyway, is that they, this understanding that they, 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 they weren't necessary. None they're of it is necessary. Wheel. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. They're a training wheel. And it's like similar with, you know, we, we have a popular concept of like upsetting boundaries. Yeah. Mm. And I kind of view, and my friend mentioned this to me, I was like, you're totally right that they're, they're training wheels and that if you are able to not be triggered by any external event mm -hmm. that's happening, mm -hmm. why do you need a boundary? Mm -hmm. Your boundary is the limit to which you're able to not react. And that's a really important point because at certain points, boundaries are in, absolutely necessary in, in the development. They like, you can't, you can't do the deeper work without a, a and, and most of the thing I've most found most interesting is that the boundary is primarily an energetic one or an attitude. Um, more than it is like, if this person does this, then I will do that. It's not like a conditional, it's, it's more, it's like an energetic boundary of like, who am I? Where is my membrane? Where, where, and this gets into the immune system because the immune system is at a biological level, rep understanding what is part of the self and what is part of no self and that it attacks not the self and that it attacks the things that it recognizes as not self. And so we have to do the same thing with our energetic or our attitude in our understanding of, of, of just where, where do I begin and where do I end uh, and, and where do other people begin and where do they end and what is that interface and you can't skip that. There is no skipping that and if you try to skip it, uh, it's going to lead you to a lot of problems. Oh, t totally. I mean, look at the number of, you know, look at the divorce rate and I would say I don't know, probably 90% of them could be resolved uh, just by people knowing themselves and who they are and being conscious about their decisions and being in relationships. So many of us have unhealed childhood, childhood wounds that we just haven't addressed. And so we end up in codependent relationships with partners that we don't understand why we're in their relationship or why we're unhappy or we're tolerating emotional abuse, but we're choosing to stay because we're afraid of being alone. Yeah. And so all those things it's because we're, there's a blending of, we don't understand where we end and someone else begins. Mm -hmm. And so through this work, you're, you know, what's the concept of holding space? You're creating a safe container for someone to feel seen and feel heard and feel loved exactly for who they truly are, not for, you know, this ego projection. So similarly, we get to create that safe container for ourselves and we say, okay, this is my space and I get to learn how and where and why I interact with things outside of that. Mm. This is really, I had a interesting way we could take this too, but I'm now losing it. Boundaries. 
space and the concept of uh, of holding space is something I feel like you know many of us get to learn and practice because mm-hmm. um, you know I, I have people in my life that I will tell them something and they'll immediately try to tell me how I should what, what I should do differently mm-hmm. and like so yes and that's not the point mm-hmm. the point is yeah just holding a resonance for somebody without taking it on yourself and allowing them that safe space to process whatever they get to process and then giving it back to them rather than taking it on for yourself. Mm -hmm. And this gets into the whole idea of why the word empath is such a uh, fraught thing because people are now starting to call themselves empaths. And uh, the idea of empath is that you take on the stuff of other people. uh, Whereas really what, might be ideal is that you don't take it on, but you witness it. You, as you say, you create a space for it, uh, but you don't take any of it on. It doesn't, it doesn't grasp onto you. Otherwise you're dealing with all sorts of horrible stuff that people have dealt with. Mm. Yeah. yeah. That's uh, so I, I would, I would challenge the, the definition of the word empath. And mm-hmm. so I, I think all of us are actually empaths once we get in the journey far enough. Mm-hmm. And to me, it's more, you know, it's the ability to hold that space and also match that space temporarily if we need to to demonstrate vulnerability. And like all you're doing through empathy is showing that you understand. How do you show? You have your own life experiences that really, in order to show that person that, you get to be maybe getting on the same level of emotion for a fraction of a second. Mm -hmm. And to show that, hey, I've been there. I know what that feels like. I'm returning to my heart center after that and allowing you to process. Interesting. That's really cool. That's a, that's a new one for me. I haven't, I haven't thought about it that way. Um, that's really cool. So, I'd, you know, we got about uh, five, 10 minutes left. Do you, are you, do you want to talk about some of the ways you're actually doing this in business and the business you're creating and, and how this is working? Yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm doing, I'm doing a few different things. So mm-hmm. one is, um, because I, I, I understand the investment and the startup scene, um, fairly well. And I've kind of built a network of conscious founders and investors at this point. So one of the things I'm doing is I'm, uh, choosing to help select companies here and there and do some fundraising, um, mm-hmm. in a conscious way and to, um, be an advisor, um, from that perspective to help them maintain their, North star and, and mission and impact focus and abundance mindset rather than being subjected to the sometimes frankly kind of annoying world of, uh, of raising capital in a venture space where it can be pretty, pretty dense and uh, mind driven. Mm. And I think, and, and in parallel, one of the things I've recognized that I really enjoy coaching people and, and helping, helping them see them the way that, that I can see them. And, you know, I've gone through that transformation of like, I went to, you know, I have like multiple master's degrees and I did, you know, went to Ivy League school and did all these things that I thought would make me feel loved and good enough. And mm-hmm. somehow I was never happy, and, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I, I went through that shift of stripping all that and really focusing on heart. And so, you know, especially for people who are founders who are successful in the traditional sense of the word, on, of the word where, you know, they have financial success but they're, they're not feeling happy or satisfied or fulfilled. And, you know, we, we both know a lot of those people, um, you know, working with people like that in a life coaching capacity to help them have that safe container for feeling heard and seen and, and loved and to kind of guide them towards that transition. Mm. So I'm building both of those. And uh, now I'm getting to uh, follow my heart rather than uh, following the mind. Mm. And, that is a really interesting conversation to be had as well. Can you be in the fundraising environment where everything is transactional? People do all sorts of horrible stuff to each other, but then can you not be of it as well? Have you, have you, you don't have to say names or anything like that, but have you, have you, have you found success in this, in this, uh, having these founders be part of that, but not get stuck in it? Mm. So, Yes, and it's similar. You can extrapolate that uh, that empathy framework that we just talked about. Yeah, where you can allow a person, you like, you can play a certain game to a certain extent, 
just to show that you understand the rules of the game and, you know, you can play. You yeah. can also bring it to a different level and then take that, you know, come back to your center and say, this is why we're doing what we're doing. And sure, we can do the necessary functioning in this venture world. Um, we understand the mechanics and we can, mm-hmm. we can raise that money. But, you know, we're, we're not driven by we're going to build a billion dollar company. We're driven by we're going to bring this thing to as many people as possible because they deserve to have it. Mm-hmm. And so it comes down to why are you, it's constantly reminding people of why they're doing what they're doing. Yeah. And guiding uh, conversations in that way. And when you're at a certain resonant frequency, uh, first of all, you manifest other investors like that. And there are more and more of them. And it's just a different level of conversation. Like you're having this kind of conversation rather than, okay, tell me about your metrics. Okay. How's your sales growing? Like you recognize, yeah, those are table stakes and those are important, but let's have a conversation about real shit. Awesome. (laughs) Uh, If you don't already have a name, I would call it real shit. Uh, (laughs) uh, uh, do you, do you, uh, here's an opportunity to just like, I love, I, I love the sense of calling out people for the, for the good work that they're doing. Um, uh, do you, do you have any investors who you'd like to call out for doing this work? Um, if our listeners are at this fundraising or just, or feel free to name your, your company and, and what you're doing. Yeah, I think in general, if people have questions or they want to have just a conversation, I'm happy to to chat with people at any point. Just, you know, feel free to pass on my, my contact info. Mm-hmm. Um, I think, you know, I haven't seen too many actual funds. Yeah, I think that's still a gr- an area of development. Mm-hmm. I, I see that a lot more with uh, entrepreneurs. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, one of the companies that you and I, I think both know is uh, One Heart, um, mm-hmm. One Heart Journeys. And um, they are taking entrepreneurs through um, through plant medicine and some uh, some other amazing things in uh, Costa Rica and other places in the world. So I've been through that journey as well. They're really, really, really high quality um, people, and uh, they're building tribe. Um, you know, I think a, a great company that I also like is Neurohacker Collective. Yeah, um, they are focusing on supplements and nootropics out of California and. Founders are super conscious and building it with that intent. And they're also running an amazing business. Actually, uh, you know, as as a disclaimer, like in my last fund, I invested in them Mm. and um, those guys are doing great. And so more and more you're finding these, you know, people are maybe it's after having sold a business or finding that somehow they're, it's just not, you know, their life is not resonating Mm. and they're looking for support, which is super important, especially when you haven't been in that world before. Um, people who can really help you shortcut. And, um, and so more and more people are coming to this realization that you can do and should do what you really love and feel called to. Mm-hmm. You can do it in a conscious way and you have a community of people who can support you. Mm-hmm. So that is really cool. Uh, and I want to do another podcast with you eventually. And that one will be on how you can uh, formula, how you can have a framework for competition from this space and how to understand how to work with comp- competition and to see it. Same, same thing. I mean, I guess we already covered it, but, but we'll do the next one on that one. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good, brother. <laughs> thank you so much for coming on. Yeah. Thank you. And for I want to give me. you the opportunity. How can, how can, uh, should, if, if people do want to get in touch with you, should they just send me a message or, or how can they? Yeah. 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 They should send you a message. Um, whether it's for, you know, they want to talk about some coaching or, uh, they just want to talk about uh, tech or AI or, or fundraising. I'm, happy to help. Yeah. Cool. Thank you so much. Yep.